and to praise. Praise him like you mean it. We welcome you to this worship experience today. We pray that you be blessed by this message today, that you be encouraged to continue on on this Christian journey. Amen. Amen. A story is told of a man who turned his back on God years ago. You see, when he was growing up, he went to church faithfully with his parents and was very involved. In fact, he never missed church. Even if his parents did not go, he remained faithful. Years later, after he had gotten married and had his own uh, son, he did not take his family to church. So his son was not brought up to honor and respect God, nor honor and respect his parents because the family lacked a biblical foundation. The man's excuse was that he was always so busy working, but even when he wasn't working, he was out on the golf course on those Sundays with his buddies or hanging out with them at a nearby bar having drinks. As the son grew, his, his teenage son, as he got older, in his teenage years, he became even more rebellious. This went on for many years, but being fed up with his son's bad behavior, the father decided to take action. The man tried everything he knew to do, but his son still was disrespectful, disobedient, and continued to run with the wrong crowd. He tried a pastor and even a psychiatrist, but to no avail. Out of the desperation, he got his son placed into a six-month boot camp tr program for troubled teens, hoping that it would turn his son's life around. However, his son returned home six months later, no different than when he had left. At his wit's end, and while sobbing with tears, the man finally cried out to the Lord. The man said, Lord, I do not understand my son at all. I have fed him, clothed him, provided a roof over his head, and loved him all of his life. Although much of the time I do not approve of his behavior, I still do many things for him because, again, I love him dearly. No matter what I do, my son never acknowledges me as his dad or treats me with the respect I deserve. My son treats me more like an enemy than a loving father. Sometimes things are so bad I feel like giving up on him, but I do not give up on him because I know that one day my son will realize that he really, really needs me. No matter what I do, I can't get him to straighten up and do what is right. The Lord responded. So now you know how I have been feeling about you for all these years. Because of all of that I have done for you, you act just like your son. Furthermore, you fail to realize that your son's rebellion is a result of watching you. In other words, like father, like son. Rebellion. What does God do with rebellion? You can call it whatever you want to call it, but when we don't walk with God as we should and we're supposed to be his children, the Bible calls that rebellion. Amen. There's no great example of that than when you turn to the book of Numbers. And it deals with the, the journey of the Israelites from Mount Sinai into the promised land. The book of Numbers takes its English name from the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of scripture, which is called Arithmoi, which we get our English word Numbers. The reason for this is that the book contains many statistics such as tribal population figures, the totals of the priests and Levites and other numerical data. The Hebrew name, Bema Bar, the fifth word in the book means in the desert of. Purpose, the book of Numbers seems to be an instruction manual to post Sinai Israel. The manual deals with three areas, how the nation was to order itself in its journeys. Number two, how the priests and Levites were to function in the condition of mobility, which lay ahead. And three, how they were to prepare themselves for the conquest of Canaan and their and their settled lives there. The theme of Numbers is the gradual fulfillment of the promises to Abraham that his descendants would be the people of God and would occupy the land of Canaan. The book shows the reality of God's presence with Israel in the pillar of cloud and the fire over the tabernacle. It also shows how Israel's unbelief delays the entry into Canaan and costs many lives. Nevertheless, by the end of the book, Israel is ready to enter the promised land after 40 years 
in the wilderness. Chapter 13 records the second of the two greatest sins during Israel's journey to the promised land. The first being the golden calf incident in Exodus 32. When the spies in Numbers 13.2 returned from scoping out the land of Canaan, uh, they expressed fear of certain occupants. The unbelief inspired by the, their fear doomed them again for a 40-year wilderness experience. Do you realize that they had obeyed God on foot? These two million plus people, these Israelites, would have left Mount Sinai and arrived in the promised land in two weeks. So how did two weeks turn into a 40-year detour? How did two weeks turn into a 40-year wilderness experience? Because they didn't move when God told them to move. They didn't obey God when God told them to obey. And they didn't believe God when God told them to believe me. Amen? You and I can suffer such a detour today. And I believe there are many Christians who have a wilderness experience because they just refuse to live their lives according to God's plan and purpose. Amen? It's amazing how many times the people want to add to God's word or reinterpret God's word and say things like, well, I don't have to go to church because guess what? Me and God got understanding. I don't have to read the Bible. It hadn't changed. I already know what it says. When you say things like that, you don't, you, then you, you've lost sight of, sight of Calvary. Because you realize what God did for us on Calvary, then we will realize how much we need him and how he wants to intervene in our everyday life. Amen. And this is something that the Israelites did not understand. If you ever want to know how we should respond to God as Christians, all you got to do is turn to the Old Testament and look at how God treated his people in the Old Testament. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 13, 8, that God is the same yesterday, today and forevermore. That means the same way he dealt with them is the same way he will deal with us. But see, we got their track record. We don't have excuse. They, didn't, they don't have our track record recorded for them. We have theirs. And if we do what they did, then we get the same results they got. Amen. So again, the sermon series is entitled God's Amazing, Unconditional, Undeserving Love for Us. So in the book of Numbers, in what evidence does the book of Numbers teach us that proves God's amazing, unconditional, deserving love for us? Well, number one, despite the, uh, the Israelites' rebellion, God showed tremendous patience. Long-suffering is the word that's used in Scripture about how patient God is. Amen? But you have to understand, one day, God's patience is going to run out with us. Amen? He's only going to be patient with us for so long before he takes action because we rebel against him. Amen. You can't keep using these excuses that what God understands. These times are difficult days and God understands. He knows my heart. But what does Jeremiah say about the heart? Above all things, it's deceitfully wicked. So you're saying, God, he remembers how wicked I really am since I'm leaning and depending on myself. Amen. In verses 1 through 4, it, says, it reads this as follows. In the 14th chapter, starting with the verse, uh, first verse here in the book of Numbers, it said, Then all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. What were they crying and weeping about? They're not crying. And, these are not joyful tears. These sorrowful tears out of disobedient disrespect. These are illegitimate, unwarranted tears because they were crying due to unbelief. These wailing people don't deserve our sympathy. The Israelites were crying because of their refusal to move forward when the, in the will of God. They literally preferred death in the land of slavery or death in the wilderness to trust in God's promises. Verse 2, all the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation said to them, would that we had died in the land of Egypt or would that we had died in the wilderness? Now, wait a minute. These are the same people that witnessed God part in the Red Sea. Same people. This, this is not a different group of people. These are the same ones that spent all those years, they had spent 400 years plus in bondage in Egypt. And they yearned for God's presence. They yearned to worship God because Egypt is a picture of what it means to be lost. Egypt is a picture of uh, to be unsaved. 
The reason why they couldn't worship God in Egypt, because you can't worship God in sin and bondage. Moses is a picture of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. Don't get it twisted. I didn't say he was Jesus Christ. He's a picture. Because Moses means to draw out. Moses was God's instrument to draw the people out of bondage in Egypt. Now that they're out, they witness God parting the Red Sea. Allowing them to walk across on dry land. Getting to the other side and watching God drown Pharaoh's army. Even after witnessing that, you'd have, said, you'd have thought they would have said, man, I believe God for anything. My God can do anything. My God can do anything. And here they are grumbling and complaining, mumbling and grumbling the whole time. They began to complain about not having water. They become complaining about not having food. Do you realize God will never send you anywhere he doesn't provide for you? Amen. If you're on the road that God has placed you in, God always has provision on his path. Amen. The steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. You find that in Psalm 37. It's important for us to understand that today that we can learn from what they did so we won't follow in their footsteps. Amen. How would you like to have been Moses and Aaron at that time? Moses, this devout man of God, re being responsible for pastoring two million plus people. Moses pastored a mega church in the desert, basically. Two million grumbling, stumbling, mumbling, complaining people, complaining about everything he did. Long, as Moses did exactly what God told him to do, and as long as Moses did what God told him to do, he complained. Amen. The whole congregation said, would it that we had died in the land of Egypt? The people have a history of complaining against divinely appointed leadership, particularly in the face of precarious situations. Unfortunately, the people accepted a majority assessment and began to protest to Moses that they would have been better off have died in Egypt or the desert that ha at the, than at the hands of the Canaanites. If you recall, all the complaining that they did when they were in bondage in Egypt. They had forgot that they had praised God, even wrote mirroring it and wrote a song about it. And they praised God and God blessed them that they didn't walk out of Egypt empty handed because God called the Egyptians to give them some of their best stuff. They didn't walk out into empty handed. They were praising God until reality uh, set in. They began to complain once again. Just like some of us, we complain and we complain and we complain. Amen. And we never take stock of where we are, an inventory of where we are and how our God has brought us. Amen. So today we really no different than the Israelites. When is, the, when is this pandemic going to be over? I'm tired of wearing this face mask. I don't want to get no vaccines. This is how we act. In spite of the fact that God is still feeding us, despite the fact he still keeps a roof over our head, amen? amen. All that he does, we still complain. People still complain about the last election. <laughs> no matter what you do, people are going to complain. Yeah. Amen? So I'm here to tell you they stop your belly aching. Stop your complaining. It's not going to do any good anyway. It didn't do them any good, so it's not going to do us any good either. Verse 3 says, why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become plunder. Would it be not better for us to return to Egypt? You know how sad that is? Do you know what they went through in Egypt? You know how bad it was for them in Egypt? And they want to return there. That means they want to return to sin. That's basically what they're saying. To fall, by, to fall by the sword, the people believe that facing the inhabitants of the land will mean certain death. They have forgotten that, that Yahweh had, has delivered them from death numerous times already and also that he had promised them victory over their, over their enemies. Verse 4 says, so they said to one another, let us appoint a leader and return to Egypt. Moses, we don't like your leadership. Let, let us born another leader. 
to go back to Egypt. Again, Egypt represents a picture of lostness. And God drawing them out through Moses was a picture of salvation. Therefore, God forbid the Israelites from going back to Egypt, which is Deuteronomy 17 and 16. Israel was forced into the slavery in Egypt. Now they were willing to seek out of fear and unbelief. Wishing to return to Egypt later came to be a biblical symbol of apostasy. They felt that they would be better off going back because they didn't want to face what's in front of them. In other words, they didn't want to wait on God to continue to order their steps. They wanted everything to be easy, just like some of us when we accept Christ as Savior and Lord, and we believe the lies of the preacher who tells us, just come on and accept Jesus and everything's going to be all right. Well, I would here submit to you that no, everything's not going to be all right. Amen. Because Satan that used to own you, now he's mad because you turn to God. Now he's going to inflict your life as much as God allows him to the rest of your life, if he allows him to. Amen. And it might get a whole lot harder before it coming any better. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces in the presence of the assembly of the congregation of sons of Israel. Moses and Aaron do not proceed Yahweh. Rather, they beg the people to consider their defiance. Moses and Aaron's plea prompts Joshua and Caleb to confront the people. Now, these four people, these are the four faithful people out of this. Moses and Aaron, Joshua and Caleb. If you recall, before this incident happened, Moses sent out 12 spies. God led Moses to send out 12 spies. Joshua and Caleb were included in those 12. One person, one man from each tribe. Ten of the spies came back and lied about what they saw. And Joshua and Caleb came back and said, no, it's a land flowing with milk and honey, just like God said. As evidence that the land was a bountiful and a spacious and a blessed land with lots of provision. They brought back a, a big glob of grapes. I don't know if you ever went in the store and saw grapes on vines so big that you need to put a pole through them and get two people to carry them. I don't know if you ever seen grapes like that at the store. I haven't. Not in that abundance. They carried all them grapes back as evidence that the land is just like we said. But guess what the people believed? They talked about the Nephilim. They talked about the, 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 the giant-sized people in the land and, and how fortified they were. And they, were, they looked at their circumstances and they looked at the other people's circumstances and they got afraid. And they lost sight of what God had said. Amen? Just like we do. In fact, we actually look at our circumstances and situations and treat our circumstances and situations bigger than we treat our God. Amen? So I would tell you, Stop going to your problem, it's going to God and tell him how big your problems are. Why don't you go to your problem and tell him how big your God is? Amen? Because God is bigger than your problems. Amen? Verse 6 says, Then the Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of uh, Jephunneh, of those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes. That's a sign of mourning. And they spoke to the, all the congregation of the sons of Israel, saying, the land which we, we, which we pass through to spy out as is an exceedingly good land. Now, look, here's, here's the caveat. Look what he says in verse, nine, in, in verse 8. If the Lord is pleased with us. Condition. If he is pleased with us. If he is pleased with us. He says. Then he will bring us into this land and give it to us a, a land which flows with milk and honey, which that's a metaphor for a blessed and prosperous land. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not fear the people of the land, for they will be our prey. Our prey. Their protection has been removed from them and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. In other words, because God is with us and he's bigger than them, God has already ruled their protection, so they're, they're actually afraid of us. Caleb and Joshua trust that God's intervention will render the, the native population defenseless. 
Verse 10 said, but all the congregation said to, to stone them with stones. Wait a minute. <laughs> what do you get for your trouble, old man, God? <laughs> the people that God calls you to lead want to stone you to death. And you thought you had a bad day. It said, then the glory of the Lord appeared. Uh-oh. That means that, that, that God's appearance, his manifest uh, glory, the manifestation of his glory has made an appearance over the tent of meeting to all the sons of Israel. The glory of the Lord refers to the divine presence of God. So what evidence does the book of Numbers, again, give us that proves God's amazing, unconditional, undeserving love for us? Number two, despite Israel, Israel, the Israelites' rebellion, Moses and Aaron interceded on their behalf. Wait a minute, these are the same people that, that, want, that they want to stone. And those same people have so much love for God and, and so much love for them. Now, I know if that had been me and you, you're just like, yeah, well, yeah, God, why don't you stone them? Talk about stoning me. <laughs> why don't you get them, God? Uh, you let God start over. Get them folk. They don't, they don't deserve this. Verse 11, it said, the Lord said to Moses, how long would this people spurn me? In other words, how long would they rebel against me? How long would they offend me? How long would they not believe in me, despite all the signs which I have performed in their midst? He said, I will smite them with pestilence and, dis and dispose them, I mean drive them out, and I will make you into a nation greater and mightier than they. In other words, Yahweh wants to destroy Israel outright. But as before, Moses pleads with him to relent on the basis of Yahweh's own reputation. Others would hear of the destruction and presume Yahweh lacked the power to bring Israel into the land. Ezekiel later uses this idea as a basis for predicting the return of Israel from exile. Moses' argument is effective. Yahweh spares Israel, but senses the rebellious generation. Everyone over the age of 20 to die in the wilderness. Of the older generation, only Joshua and Caleb will see and uh, inherit the land. Do you realize Moses and Aaron didn't even go into the land? Moses did everything right except one thing he did. And it cost him. He still went to heaven. But it cost him for his going to the promised land on his earth. Well, what did he do? Well, Moses has gotten so fed up with the people. And there's only so much a preacher can stand. And... The people were in the wilderness again. They would move from place to place, and each place they got to. Remember, God still provided for them. Despite the fact that they were there wandering around in the desert for 40 years, God still made provision for them. It shows you God's amazing, unconditional, undeserving love. They're in that condition because of their own uh, lack of faith. They're in that condition because of their own disobedience. But God said, because they're my people, I'm still going to provide to them, provide for them, even through these difficult times. So he provided them manna, which was bread from heaven. And God, God has set it up where every day when they woke up, that bread, that, that manna would be on the ground. And they could take as much as they want to eat, but they could not save any. Only on Friday to Saturday from the, from the Sabbath. Because they weren't supposed to do any work on the Sabbath. So on Fridays, they could, they, God allowed them to gather two portions. And it didn't spoil. But they even tested God on that. Because they went out there and they tried to keep some for the next day instead of waiting on fresh manna. Guess what? It had worms in it. God allowed to spoil. But then God said to them, that's disobedience. That's rebellion. Because I told you that I was going to provide for you every day. And when they got tired of eating the bread from heaven, and they, we want some meat, then God would send quail. They didn't even have to go and catch the quail. The quail would probably just fly by and just die in their present. Take me, cook me, eat me. <laughs> they didn't have to set quail traps. 
Quayle just flew up and said, hey, I'm your dinner. God sent me. Enjoy. Amen. And after all God's blessings, they still behaved the way they did. Moses and Aaron's leadership, they still behaved the way they did. On one particular occasion, Moses was up to here with them. He was fed up. He was fed up with these grumbling, mumbling, complaining people. And they get to this place and God told him this the first time he told him to strike the rock. So the water would come out. This time he told him just point the rod at the rock, the staff that he carried. Out of frustration, Moses, Moses says, wham! <laughs> he slammed against the rock. Shall I bring forth water? He said. And God says, Moses, for that, you cannot enter the promised land. Well, what was so bad about that? Because that had a theological significance. You know what the theological significance was? It was tied to Jesus' death on Calvary. Because Jesus is only going to be struck once. That means he's only going to Calvary once. He's not going to Calvary again. Been there, done that. The fact that he struck the rock twice would symbolize that Jesus would have to go to Calvary again. And for that disobedience, and for that outburst, God did not allow him into the promised land because of that. That left Joshua and Caleb and everybody that was 19 years old and younger to go into the promised land. Remember what they said? They felt that their children would be prey. But God reversed it and their children are the one that survived. They the one died. But there's something else God did to show his un amazing, unconditional, undeserving love. He fed them daily. He gave them water, fresh water daily. And not only that, I don't know about you, I don't think the outfit you've been wearing has last 40 years. I don't think those shoes that you got on have been 40 years old. I, I, don't, I don't think so. Because clothing wears out. If it doesn't wear out, you grow out of it. <laughs> Either by foot or width. <laughs> Amen. But God made it so that their clothes did not wear out. 40 years that they journeyed. But all of those who were 20 years and older, they would just drop dead. They were having funerals left and right. You got you to gotta remember, this is two million plus people. So every day they were having funeral services. Because God was allowing those who had rebelled against him to die. Wow. And we read this story. And as Christians, we still behave like they behave. And you wonder why there's Christians dropping dead today. Because, again, God's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Amen? Verse 13, Moses said to the Lord then, uh, now look, listen to how Moses intercedes. Moses heard what God said. But whose interest is Moses looking out for? His? No. Because if Moses was looking out for his interest, he'd have told, he said, God, I, I wish you God, I'd just take them out. I don't like them anyway. I used to. In fact, I used to be in love with them. That left a long time ago. I can only take been called so many names, Lord. I can take be threatened my life, threatened so many times, Lord. Look what he says. He said, then the Egyptians will hear of it. Verse 13. For by your strength, you brought up this people from their midst, and they will tell it to the inhabitants of this land. They have heard that you, O Lord, are in the midst of this people, for you, O Lord, are seen eye to eye while your cloud stands over them, and you go before them in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Unmistakably, when people came in contact with Israel, they saw the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. God's presence with them, in other words, he would, he would, he would give them guidance during the day, and he would give them guidance through the night. But those symbols meant his protection. So anybody saw them would see those elements. 
which is why the fear of God fell on the every, all the inhabitants of the land. Amen. Amen. Verse 15, he says, now, if you slay this people as one man, then the nations who have heard of your fame will say, because the Lord could not bring this people into the land which he promised them by oath. Therefore, he slaughtered them in the wilderness. Hmm. Verse 17, but now I pray, let the power of the Lord be great, just as you have declared. The Lord is slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness for forgiving iniquity and transgressions, but he will not by no means clear the guilty. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generations. In the beginning of that, he uses this word loving kindness. That's the Hebrew word has said. Has said is God's covenant love that he has for his people that's in covenant with him. Amen. So anytime you see that word in, in the Old Testament, that word loving kindness, that's that Hebrew word has said, is covenantal love. Amen. And because of that covenant that God made, that he's going to love his people no matter what. Because remember, God's love is unconditional, but his blessings are very conditional. Remember Deuteronomy chapter 28? He said, if, if you obey these, these, these provisions I'm giving you today, Blessed will you be in the city. Blessed will you be in the field. Blessed will you go out. Blessed will you come in. I'll bless uh, your kneading bowl. That you make your dough and bread. I'll bless the labors of your hand. I'll bless you coming in. I'll bless you going out. Remember he said that? But he said, if you. That's conditional. And for you to experience that, you must obey. See, there are so many people today, they want God's provision. They want God's protection. They want God's guidance. They want God's blessing. But they don't want to obey God. They don't want to obey God. He goes on to say in verse 19, he said, pardon, I pray the iniquity of this people. According to the greatness of your loving kindness. That's the word that he used that word again has said. In other words, he said, God, don't do it for them. Do it for you. Do it so your name can be praised in this earth. Do it on the basis that people won't say you can't take care of what's yours. Because, Lord, you know, these people around here are not saved. So they don't know any better. They don't have your spirit the way we do. So they're not going to get it. So Lord, I appeal to your loving kindness and covenant of love that you have for us. Not saying that we deserve it because we don't deserve it. We deserve death. But based on what you promised, Lord, I'm standing on your promise. What a prayer. Would you pray for people like that? Have they been talking about you? Would you pray for people like that? <laughs> when they want to beat you down? They want to take you out? They want to cancel your leadership? That's how he prayed. Thank God for Moses. So again, third point. What evidence does the book of Numbers give us that proves God's amazing, unconditional, undeserving love for us? Number three, despite Israel's rebellion, God still forgave them. Did you catch that? If God forgave them, why don't you think he couldn't forgive you? The problem is, is that we don't ask. You have to ask for forgiveness. For forgiveness to be extended. You cannot just live in your sins and then expect God understands. Because this comes up over and over again in the New Testament. In 1 John, chapter 1, in 1 John, he tells us, he said, this is the message we receive from God we give to you. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. In other words, John is giving eyewitness to Jesus' miracles and message on this earth. He said, if you confess your sins, God is faithful and just to forgive you of sins and cleanse you all in righteousness. Who is he talking to? He's not, to, not talking to non-believers because the epistles of John are written to Christians who had strayed away. And so he gives them an opportunity through prayer they can make the right relationship right with God. Amen. Because you can't have sin between you and God expect to go anywhere with God. Amen. So in, these, in verses 20 through 38, in response to the people's rebellion and Moses' plea, Yahweh proclaimed that he would not, he would not wipe them out. But he will, he will make the people wander for 40 years until every number of the rebellious generations passed away. He forgave them. But here's, here's, here's what you got to understand. Remember, I always tell you this. 
Sin will always do three things to you. Sin will always keep you longer than you want to be kept. Sin will always cost you more than you're willing to pay. And t- sin will take you further than you're willing to go. All right? Remember, I always tell you that here at Agape. Sin will cost you more than you're willing to pay, take you further than you're willing to go, keep you longer than you won't be kept. All right? That's the principle of sin. Now, because sin has consequences, God said, I'll forgive them. But the consequence is that all those who are 20 years and older will drop dead in the next 40 years uh, because of their rebellion. So the Lord said, I have pardoned them, verse 20, according to your word. In other words, I have forgiven them according to your word. The, the people were spared immediate judgment, but they still were punished for their sin. They eventually died without having seen the land. A deserved punishment. Since their children will survive and inherit it, the covenant will ma- be maintained. Verse 21, but indeed, as I, as I live, the earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord. Surely all the men who have, been, who have seen my glory and my signs which I perform in Egypt and in the wilderness yet have, have put me to the test these ten times, and I have not listened and they have not listened to my voice. In other words, that word listen, that means obey. That, that's a Hebrew word, Shema. It means to listen with the hi- intent of obeying. All right? Signs, he talked about these four examples, the ten plagues that he did. Crossing the Red Sea, manna from heaven, and divine fire. Those are some of the signs that God did that he should have took heed to. These ten times is metaphoric. God, God had done that more than ten times, but this is a metaphor it doesn't necessarily mean 10 exact times. It's a figure of speech meaning too many. The point is that Israel has a habit of testing Yahweh, and this is a habit he does not appreciate. Verse 23, shall, shall by no means see the land. These people shall not see the land which I swore to their forefathers, nor shall any of them who spurned me, in other words, who disobeyed me, uh, but my, my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit. Let me ask you a question. Do you have a different spirit? Or do you have the same spirit as everybody else in the world? As a believer, you should have a different spirit. If you got the same spirit, then something wrong with you. Amen? But it says, Caleb have a different spirit and has followed me fully. I will bring him bring into the land which he entered, and his descendants shall take possession of it. Now the Amalekites and the Canaanites live in the, in the valleys, turn tomorrow and set out to the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. In other words, instead of telling them to go forward, he made them turn back. And this started that circle, that wandering. He said, the Lord spoke to Moses and said, saying, how long shall I bear with this evil uh, congregation who have grumbled against me? I have heard the complaints of the sons of Israel, which they are making against me. Say to them, as I live, Says the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will surely do to you. He said, your corpses will fall in the wilderness, even all of your numbered men, according to the complete number from 20 years old and upward, who have grumbled against me. Again, Deuteronomy 8, 4 says, your clothes did not wear out and your feet did not swell during these 40 years. I don't know about you. The, uh, when I stand too long, Walk too long. I don't know about you. My feet automatically swell. Does yours? Maybe you have good feet. I don't know. That it happen to you. Maybe that's my problem. I don't know about you. You walk anywhere for 40 years. <laughs> it said not, not only their shoes not wear out, boy, them some good shoes. They were better than Nikes, Reeboks, and all those. They, 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 they were some good shoes. And it said their feet did not swell. Walking in a hot desert? Yeah, your foot swell. It said, surely you shall not come into the land in which I swore to you, settle you, verse 30, except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. He said, your children, however, whom you said will become a prey, I will bring them in, and they will know the land which you have rejected. But as for me, but I mean, but as for you, he said, your corpses will fall uh, in this wilderness. He said, your sons shall be shepherds for 40 years in the wilderness, and they will suffer for your unfaithfulness until your corpses lie in the wilderness. Do you know that your children can, can suffer for your disobedience against God? 
If, if, if one of you get arrested and goes to jail, does not your family suffer? If you lose your job, does not your family suffer? In other words, part of the penalty was that their children would suffer because of what they did. But if the children went into the land and obeyed, then God will continue that, that covenant you know, love that has said that we talked about. God removes any ambiguity as the cause of the nomadic lifestyle forced on the Israelites. Any suffering experienced during this time is attributed to the people's choice in refusing to believe the promises of Yahweh. In other words, they brought it on themselves. Verse 34 said, according to the number of days which you spied out the land, 40 days for every day you shall bear your guilt a year for every 40 years, and you will know my opposition. What if God made you suffer for every, every day that you were disobedient? For every day he gave you a year. Every day that you knew what God told you to do. Every day you were rebellious. Every day you didn't walk before him and be humble. For every day he made it a year that you, was, you would walk in the wilderness. I would submit to you that many of us be walking in the wilderness more than 40 years. Many of us will never come out of the wilderness. Amen. Verse 35, he said, I, the Lord, have spoken, surely. In other words, signs still another. When he said, I have spoken, that means you can't change it. It's said, it's done. Surely this I will do to all this evil congregation who have gathered together against me. In this wilderness, they shall be destroyed, and, they, and there they will die. As for the men whom, who Moses sent to spy out the land and whom re returned and made all the congregation grumble against me by bringing out a bad report concerning the land, even those men who brought out the, the very bad report of the land died by a plague before the Lord. In other words, the 10 spies who incited unbelief and rebellion did not die of natural causes like everybody else. In their own time, like the others, but died shortly after the punishment was pronounced. In other words, God just called them drop dead for lying on him. Now, if God did that then, do you think he still would do that today? Well, a whole lot of people be dropping dead because a whole lot of people be lying on God. Amen. Saying God told them something God didn't tell them. Amen. Teaching people stuff that God didn't say God, that, that he said. But they promised, they, they swam it down that God told them that. Verse 38, but Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, remained alive out of those men who had spied out the land. Finally, I want to get to this last point before I close, because this is really important. Watch, watch what happens. And his third point is this, because some of the Israelites continued to rebellion, God had to allow them to be taught a hard lesson. Now, if the lesson they had been taught already hadn't been hard enough, guess what they did? Watch this. It said the Israelites in verse 39 to 45 of chapter 14, the Israelites re, uh, response to Yahweh's punishment is a futile effort to overturn the punishment themselves by obeying his original man to take the land of Canaan. The result is, of course, tragic. Verse 39 says, when Moses spoke these words to all the sons of Israel, the people mourned greatly. In the morning, however, they rose up early and went up to the ridge of the, of the hill country, saying, here we are. We have indeed sinned, but we will go up to the place which the Lord had promised. But Moses said, why then are you transgressing the commandment of the Lord when he when it will not succeed? They're late. They didn't move when God told them to move. So that so that invitation expired. A brother way to say that the invitation was delayed. Because they didn't move when God told them to move, then the invitation was delayed for 40 years. Now, what they tried to do, they heard what Moses said. They're crying. Uh, they're mumbling. They, I mean, they, 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 they act like they're repentant, but they're not. And they heard what God said. But they think that if they go do it now, then God will forget about what he said. Remember, they didn't move when God told them to move. Remember, even Joshua and Caleb said, no, don't do this. God will give us victory if we just do not rebel against them. But they kept that same heart, same attitude. 
Watch this. It said, do not go up or you will be struck down before your enemies. For the Lord is not among you. For the Amalekites and the Canaanites will be there in front of you and you will fall by the sword in so much as you have turned your back from following the Lord and the Lord will not be with you. That should have been enough. That lets you know that everything that you and I do as Christians, God don't go with us with that. Amen. You got to you got to get this point. You can say I'm Christian. I'm saved. I'm going to hang out at this club. Well, God ain't going in to hang out in the club with you. God ain't going to the happy hour bar to go get your drink your drink on. He ain't going with you with that either. In other words, you on your own, no covering. Anytime you go and participate in something that God did not ordain, then you go with no covering. Amen. Therefore, you are left to whatever it, that you going against. that want to come against you. Because look what happens. It says that verse 44, it said, but they went up headlessly to the ridge of the hill country, neither the ark of the covenant of the Lord nor Moses left the camp. That's just told you. When you start to walk out that camp and the ark of the Lord didn't go with you, you said, well, back the truck up. Because the ark of the Lord re represented God's divine presence with his people. And if the ark didn't go, then you didn't move. Not only that, when Moses didn't move, you don't move. Because he's your divine appointed leader. When he said, I ain't going. And of course, the ark of God ain't going with you. He basically said, y'all on your own. But they had to find it out the hard way. They thought just because they were God's people, they can do as they please. Hmm. It says that this is why later on the Philistines will think it is a good idea to steal the ark, although they would learn otherwise. Because you can't steal something that you don't have a blessing to use. Amen. You have people all the time. They want to pray. They say, in Jesus name, I pray. Well, you don't belong to him. You can't use that name. You have no authority with that name. You can't call on a name that, guess what? You have no authority to use because you're not in Christ. Amen. It said, then the Amalekites, verse 45, and the Canaanites who lived in the hill country came down and struck them and beat them down. When the Bible uses the phrase beat down, that's, that's a lot stronger than how we use beat down. And you know what a beat down, I ain't say beat up. It didn't say beat up. It said beat down. And when somebody beats you down in scripture, that means you beat down down. As far as Hormah, get this, the, the place where they were beat down was called destruction. Hormah. In other words, they got a whipping they would never forget. Just totally be down. Because they didn't move when God told them to move. God had previously told them when to go, where to go, what to do. And he said, no, we're not going. And when they find, figured out they made a mistake, they're going to try to move. But then the problem is, is that the, the invitation was delayed. It was withdrawn. So they couldn't go then because God said, I'm not going with you. But even in all that, we still see God's amazing, unconditional, undeserving love. You can read about all that they did and all that they continue to do. But God still preserved their children. He allowed them to die because they said, y'all old enough, y'all should know better. But he still kept his covenant going by allowing their children to continue to the promised land. But the goal was to teach them a lesson to learn from. And sometimes we learn if we follow the text that they didn't learn those lessons very long. So when God shows his amazing, unconditional, undeserving love to us, what do we do? We should always want to experience that. And the way that we live our lives, we should not want to do anything that would hinder us from experiencing God's amazing, unconditional, undeserving love. Amen? Because that only happens if you're obedient. You cannot be a part-time Christian and experience God has said his covenant of love every day. You cannot be a long ranger Christian and do that. And you definitely can't be a double L seven, a secret agent Christian, like you're on a mission for yourself, because you definitely ain't on a mission for God. God wants us to experience. He don't want us to just read about him. He wants us to experience him every day.
But the key for you today is this. Do you experience them every day? Or has your sin got in the way? Have you decided things you're not going to do? If God has made a way, if you trust God, let me put it this way as I close. The, uh, when we were in the military, that especially when I would go to the desert, I got a number of different vaccines. Why would they do that? Why would they give me those vaccines before I left and I got some when I got there? Because they knew the environment and the climate that my body was not ready for. So what I had to be inoculated so that I can still survive in that climate without getting sick. Right. And so because it's part of what you're ordered to do. Because the military is looking out for the research that they did if you don't get these vaccines. I got anthrax and everything else before I went. Um, the first time in the, I think the first uh, beginning time we had, we still had other shots. But the reason why I'm telling you this is this. As I pray and as you pray, God don't always answer our prayers the way we think he ought to answer our prayers. And sometimes God provides the answer in a way that sometimes we don't want to accept that answer. But I trust that if this is what God has provided for right now, so that I can continue to do his will and do ministry for his cause, as many people as I'm around, I had to make a decision. My family had to make a decision. Well, I would have the vaccine than have the disease. I had both shots. We both had both shots. We're fine. But I trust God that by faith, taking the shots, because I didn't want to be sick and I want to pass any sickness on to anybody else. That's a faith step. And the thing is, is this, is that I don't know. But I do know this, that if I trust God, and if that's the provision he has made, then I'm going to take the provision he provides. Because if I don't, then what's the alternative? Right? Enough people that I know, and enough people that I've heard about have gotten sick and died. And that's not a way that I want to leave here. And so I want to be here for years to be able to lead this church so that God can bless this church continuously and bless us all in order we can do his will. You can take that or leave it. Just try to lead by example. Because that's the means what God provides. As you pray through it, talk to your doctor if you need to. But I would rather that you are safe than being infected. In December, a dear sweet lady passed. She had invited us to her home for, uh, for lunch, for, where they have uh, dinner after church, or early dinner. My friend, Dr. Ed Justice, his mom, Ms. Downs, would invite us to her home with the rest of her kids and treated us like she, we were her kids. She's the mama of their church. She passed and went to be with the Lord in December. Dr. Justice, Dr. Downs, her other son, the both pastors on the east side of Fort Worth, they were meeting at her home to have funeral arrangements, to have a home-going service for her. Everybody in that house got sick except about two people. COVID. Who got the worst of it? My friend, Dr. Ed Justice. When I talked to him after he had recovered, he said he had never been that sick in his life. And he had lost 20 pounds. I've heard enough stories. I've done funerals. I've been in funeral arrangements by the grace of God that he did not allow me to have COVID. Um, 
but when a means is provided that I continue to do ministry and know, you don't know who you're around and who you're exposed to. But at least you can take care of yourself. The vaccine is not designed that you can never get COVID again. It's designed so COVID won't kill you. That you won't have an adverse effect to it like some people. Not everybody has that kind of adverse effect from it. But the people that I know I talked to that had it, and some of them still have symptoms from it. I think there's an old saying of wisdom, you'd rather be safe than sorry. Because I don't know about you, I miss fellowship with everybody. We will always continue to do worship online to reach those who enjoy our service. But I do miss Sunday school. I do miss the potlucks and the fellowships. But we won't get back there until God intervenes, until we imply we all submit to what he has intervened so that we can without infecting one another. And I hope that you encourage to know that God's amazing unconditional love that he has for us, undeserving. He loves us and he has commanded us to love one another. And because I love you, one reason why I got vaccinated because I don't want to be sick or to get sick from you or make you sick. And I leave you with that. And to God be the glory for great things he has done. Give the Lord a hand of praise. Let us pray together. Eternal God, our Father, we bow before you, O God, thanking you for this day. For all those on the sound of my voice, maybe you have not experienced God's amazing, unconditional, undeserving love. And maybe it's because there's sin in your life that's been in the way. But right now, at this very moment, you can turn your heart and life back to God. Because if today was your last day on this earth, how, where would you spend eternity? And are you 100% sure? If you're not sure that you would go be with the Lord in heaven, pray this prayer with me. Just say, Lord Jesus, here I am. I admit that I'm a sinner and I want to be saved. Lord, I heard you loud and clear today. And maybe it's because I've not been experiencing all your blessings you have in store for me because my life has not been totally obedient to what you would have me to do. And for that, I'm sorry. I ask for your forgiveness. Lord, right now, I pray. I turn my heart and my life over to you, O oh God. You've blessed me with employment. You've you blessed me with income. You've blessed me with those around me where I don't have to walk this journey by myself. And you've been far better to me than I deserve. So today, oh God, all of me belongs to all of you. I give you everything I have and all that I am, all that I have belongs to you. I submit my will to your will, oh God. And I accept Jesus as my Savior and my Lord. I pray all these things in Jesus' name and all of God's people said amen and amen. Your love is kind. Your love is patient. You feel my heart. Wait so much.
You feel my heart with so much peace and joy. You're amazing. You make my life feel brand new. You're Thank you for loving me too much. Thank you for loving me too much. Thank you for loving us too much. Thank you for loving us so, 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 so much. You are amazing. You make my life feel brand new. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for loving us so much. Thank you for loving us so much. So thank you. All of a God, say amen. Let all of a copy say amen again. I hope you've been encouraged and blessed today. Hope your spirit has been touched. Your heart has been moved. And I hope that you've been encouraged to stay on this Christian journey. To run the race. To get to the end. Because we know where the end will be. An everlasting presence with almighty God in person. We look forward today when God comes and gets his church. The question for you, will you be ready for Christ's return? Amen? Amen. Have you been blessed today by today's message to those who are tuning in today on the internet? We invite you to go to agapecommunityfellowship.org and you can donate to our church, to our ministry. We would encourage you to go and donate. Those of you who have been donating, we want to say thank you. Thank God for you for that. There's another ways that you can donate. You can donate. Uh, there's a link there. You can donate online. That's also a way you can donate and have it mailed to the church, as some do. Or you're welcome to show up in person if you are in this area to worship with us. We thank God for each of you. And we want to invite you to also give toward our mission fund to help our Nigerian families as they continue their journey through seminary. Again, we thank God for each of you. Regardless how crazy our politics get and things get that we see around the world, never take your eyes off Jesus. We pray in this new year that God would open to the windows of heaven and bless us with his very best. Whatever his best is, he has for in store for us. We also pray that he would give us the strength to handle what he's walking us through each and every day. We also ask that he would bless us with all the resources we need. Whatever we're lacking, that he would not only meet it, but it exceed it individually as well as collectively, that we may be able to do his will. Amen? Amen. As a reminder, on Next Sunday at 5 p.m., we have a memorial service. It's just tales, Mom. If you'd like to join us in person, you can. If you'd like to tune in online, you can.
That'd be at 5 p.m. on next Sunday. Let us all stand and receive our benediction. Thank you for coming today. It's always good to lay eyes on you. Those who tune in, thank you for tuning in as well. You can also pass it on to others you think we could benefit from this message today. Again, they can just go to our website. The link is there. They upload the message before uh, we leave today. Receive your benediction. May God bless you and keep you. May he always make his face to shine upon you and give you his peace. May nothing you face in life be anything you or God cannot handle. May you go forward today knowing that God's amazing, unconditional, undeserving love that he has for us is always there for us. He's a present help in trouble. He's a friend that sticks close in the brother. He is everything to us. He is the great I am. He's our, our Jehovah Jireh, our provider. He's our Jehovah Rophi, our healer. He's everything we need. All we have to do is continue to walk under his covenant of love each and every day. And may God watch between me and you until we meet again as I pray. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen, amen, and amen. Give the Lord a hand of praise.